You're listening to Write Like Hell, Dark Fantasy and Horror Anthology, Volume 1. Written by Mitchell Luti, Justin Proben, and Scott Miller. Performed by Scott Miller. Produced by Citadel Studios for Sentinel Creatives. Dregmere by Mitchell Luti. The gates of Dregmere Castle were shut tight, sealed with great padlocks of iron. There was little to indicate that the entrance was still in use, but the man stood before it patiently. They told him it was open. Rust had started to chew through the locks. Thin tendrils of ivy grew across the wall and onto the gate itself, and cobwebs hung from the corners like tiny nets. A single bulb illuminated the gate, blanketing the sidewalk with a warm yellow glow. Simon Burke peered back and forth along the wall, hoping to see another opening, but there was nothing. Bugger it, he said beneath his breath, and wrapped a hand against the gate. Behind him, the light of his cab was fading. It disappeared for a moment hidden by the sloping hills that surrounded Dregmere, and then reappeared, this time further away. It was headed toward the blur of light and colour on the horizon, the town of Krasno. Simon waited a moment longer before he stepped back and examined the gate. No doorbell, no welcome sign, and, he glanced at his phone, no signal. He set his backpack on the ground and turned toward Krasno. The cab had finally vanished for good, leaving only the lights of the town itself in the distance. He'd have to walk back now, wandering through the night until he found a place with signal. He removed his glasses and rubbed his tired eyes. Another uncomfortable stay in Krasno's solitary youth hostel it was then. Can I help you, sir? Simon flinched at the sound and turned to face the castle. A small man stood hunched down before him, beside an open panel in the gate, The newcomer frowned, stepping away from the wicket gate and lifting a lantern as he did so. Opening hours are between nine and five. His English was good, though Simon could detect a hint of the cadence common to these parts in his voice. Bookings for the rooms are to be made in advance. I have a booking. Simon replaced his glasses and patted down his jacket pockets. Somewhere in here, the steward tuttered beneath his breath in a manner universal to all service staff but said nothing. Here it is, said Simon finally. He pulled a crumpled printout from the pockets of his jeans and handed it to the man. The steward glanced at it for a moment, a grey brow raised in doubt. Seeing nothing to arouse further suspicion, he handed back the paper and nodded. Right you are, sir. He turned his back on Simon and hobbled toward the wicket gate. If you'd just follow me, please. After a moment, Simon picked up his backpack and stepped into Dregmere Castle. He followed the steward across the black cobblestones of a small courtyard and then into what he took to be the lobby. You'll need to fill in the register before I show you to your room. The steward limped behind the entrance desk, switching off his lantern and placing it on the table. How many nights will you be staying with us? Just tonight said Simon. I'm to meet a colleague, in fact. He hasn't booked in already, perhaps. Uh, Joseph Helder. The steward shook his head and opened his palm toward the register. You're the first guest we've had all week. He glanced down at the book and shrugged. The last entry seemed to be from a while ago, longer than a week by some time. That's all right. Would you let him know I'm here when he arrives? Of course. Simon scribbled down his name and details, then smiled up at the steward. All set. This way, sir. The steward shuffled out from behind the desk and directed him toward a pair of open doors on the other side of the room. The doors led to a narrow stairway, covered by a thick carpet of orange and reds. Striking patterns spiraled across the matted wool beneath his feet, dense configurations of exotic shapes and symbols. A more recent addition, Simon thought. The brash colours and modern design seemed out of place with the rest of Dregmir's sombre interior. When they reached the first floor, the steward paused, clearly battling with whatever infliction was rooted beneath his limp. Simon waited patiently, 
resting on his heels and staring down at the row of rooms. The walls of the corridor seemed to slant, just a little too far to the left. It had a slightly dizzying effect, and Simon hoped his own level was better balanced. He doubted it. A halogen bulb flickered above, ticking over to its own tempo and spluttering pale light down into the corridor. In the dim light, he saw a series of paintings adorn the walls beside each of the doors. Uninspired pieces that looked as if they may be as old as the castle itself. Next floor, said the steward, but made no effort to continue upward. Simon was content to stare vacantly at the dusty grey walls around him, while the steward caught his breath and stretched his knee. He had nowhere to be. The halogen tube flickered once more, as if wheezing out its last breath, and then went out, leaving a part of the corridor in the dark. The steward would have to replace that, bum leg and all, thought Simon dourly. He shook his head at the image of the man trying to drag a ladder up the stairs. He'd have to offer his help, or it'd rest poorly on his conscience. With a dull hum, the bulb flickered back on, and Simon found himself staring at one of the paintings. He was about to turn away when something caught his eye, and he hesitated. What is that? He gently nudged the steward on the shoulder and pointed toward the canvas. The man squinted at the frame for a moment and then pursed his lips, turning to Simon. That is the trial of Saint Ophelia by Timur Goryanov. It is wonderful, don't you think? Simon struggled with the idea that it was wonderful. Artistically, it seemed there was little of merit to the piece. The brushstrokes were thick and clumsy. Gurionov's use of colour had been erratic, seemingly nonsensical at times, and yet there was no denying that there was something attractive about it. The painting elicited a primal emotion from him that he couldn't quite identify, and he found himself reluctant to draw his eyes away from it. It is, he said, finally meeting the steward's gaze. It, uh, it pulls you in, doesn't it? The steward chuckled, the pain in his knee quite forgotten, and continued up the flight of stairs. That it does. He thumped the balustrade with a hand and motioned to Simon. Next floor. Come! The next morning, Simon drank lukewarm coffee and ate a breakfast of hard-cooked eggs, pickled meats, and smoked sausage. Joseph had not yet checked in, and Simon was growing impatient and a little bored. I'm going into town, he said, buttoning up his anorak as he walked through the lobby. The steward stood up from behind his desk, marking a place in his book with a thumb. Will you be walking, sir? Only to Krasno. I'll take a cab back. The steward nodded and returned to his novel, seemingly satisfied. Outside was cold, and Simon huddled down in his hood as he walked toward the town. It'd take the better part of an hour to get there, but that didn't matter. The exercise would soon warm him, and there was nothing to do in Dregmere anyway. He rubbed his hands together and stared up at the hills surrounding the castle. The stronghold sat in the centre of a valley, and was eclipsed on all sides by large hillocks and thickly wooded knolls. To the west, the hills turned into a staggered mountain range that went as far as the eye could see. To the east, the forest slowly parted until only the white and grey structures of the town were visible. They weren't in the painting, Simon found himself thinking. Timur Gurionov's Trial of St. Ophelia featured none of the modern-day housing that had emerged in the last fifty years or so. The painting was far older. Simon paused to take in his surrounds fully, turning on his feet as he gazed at the countryside. He hated to admit it, but Gurionov had quite captured the essence of the place, even if his use of colour and proportion felt a little unorthodox. He'd rendered the place's soul, rather than its aesthetic. Simon laughed at the thought and continued his stroll, feeling more comfortable now that he was out and about. For lunch, he had a savoury pie the locals referred to as burek, and a can of soda. He spent the afternoon observing the comings and goings of the town, idling through the shops and people-watching. He'd finally gotten in touch with Joseph, who had apologised profusely and promised he'd be in town with the next train, which could be today, tomorrow, or even the next day. Simon only had another week off before he'd be expected back at the university, but he'd managed to mask his annoyance enough to wish Joseph a safe trip. They'd been friends since undergrad, and while Joseph had fallen into a cushy corporate job, Simon had ended up in academia. The pay wasn't great, and future prospects were slim, but it felt comfortable, and that's all he really wanted from a job. The cab dropped him in the parking lot he'd been delivered to the night before, and sped off before he could thank the driver. The steward wasn't in the lobby when he arrived, so he headed upstairs for a quick shower before dinner. When he reached the first floor, he turned into the corridor for a better look at Gurionov's work. Up close, the painting seemed even more absurd. 
Discordant shades of yellow and green intermingled with purple and orange. Thick strokes cut across the canvas, attempting details where even the most delicate of hands would have required restraint. The scene depicted an event Simon was unfamiliar with, but no doubt had some historical significance to the locals. A woman, presumably Saint Ophelia, stood with her hands held open in a gesture of peace while a crowd of angry-faced men and women bounded toward her. From their brandished fists and assortment of sharp objects, it was clear they meant to do her harm. Behind the saint, on a hill Simon recognized as the closest to Castle Dragnir, stood three men. They encircled a small fire and watched the proceedings with wicked smiles. Simon resolved to quiz the steward about Krasno's history over dinner, and wandered back up the steps to his own room. Dinner was better than expected. The steward, for Simon hadn't seen any other staff around, had put together a delicious platter of egg noodles, roasted tomato, mash, and beef paprikash. Simon washed it down with a glass of red wine, and sank into his chair with a contented sigh. The food was to your liking, sir? The steward offered to top up his wine, and Simon accepted with a nod. I did! It was fantastic! My compliments to the chef! He gave the steward a knowing smile, but it went unnoticed. Or the steward simply didn't care. Very good, sir. If you need anything else, simply call and I will avail myself. The steward tilted his head and made to leave when Simon remembered himself. Actually, I was wondering if you could tell me a little about Krasno and Dregmir. Aside from the contents of a few tourist pamphlets, I know very little about this place. Would you mind? Simon waved at the empty seat opposite his own and smiled at the steward. Of course, sir. He undid the lower button on his blazer, brushing it open with a flick of the wrist, before sitting down. He placed both his hands on the table, palms down, and stared at Simon. What is it you would like to know? Again, that subtle lilt in his voice, the way he hummed his vowels, dragged out the final syllable in each word. Who built this castle? Tell me about Dregmir. It predates the town, said the steward. Maxim Ivanovich built it in the early 15th century. It stood as a bulwark against the encroaching Ottoman Empire, and against our Romanian neighbors, too. A Wallachian family managed to conquer and hold it, briefly in the 1500s, but it was quickly returned to Ionovich's heirs. And who owns it now? That would be Sofia Basara, a descendant of Maxim himself. Simon nodded and took a deep draught of his wine, enjoying the smoky bouquet before he continued. Tell me about the saint. He placed his glass on the table and stared pointedly at the steward. What event does Gurionov seek to depict in that painting of his? The steward smiled and leaned back in his seat. I see Timor has captured your imagination too. A fascinating piece, yes? The story behind it is even more interesting. It begins shortly after Maxim Ionovich passed away. His heir, Pavel, is hot-blooded and ill-suited to rule. Violent but predictable, he is easy to control. The steward licked the corner of his lips. Corruption seeped into Dragmir, and Pavel's advisors grew rich. That is, until he met Ophelia. The saint, Simon felt himself mutter. Indeed, the steward smiled. Something changed in the boy when he met Ophelia. She counteracted his more violent tendencies, soothed the rage in his heart. The boy actually began to rule. The steward scratched at something beneath a nail, before staring back at him. His fingers were dirty, Simon thought. Dirtier than the nails of someone who'd just made his dinner had any right to be. Not dirt, he realized. Paint. The realization did little to lessen his thoughts on the matter, but it was better than the alternative. This did not suit all of Pavel's benefactors, the steward continued. Those who had grown rich from his incompetence saw the threat and moved against her. Rumors began to spread, decrying Ophelia as a spy for the Wallachian families up north. And worse, some said she was a heretic, a servant of the thrice-damned Belioth. Belioth? The name felt strange on his lips, and rung stranger in his ears. A vengeful spirit cursed by God and the devil to wander the earth until the end times. What he did to deserve such a thing is anyone's guess. He was known to the Ottomans as the Jinn al-Musira, and he is said to have caused them much trouble during their occupation here. The steward giggled at this, a rather unpleasant sound to come from a man nearing his sixties. Simon shook his head at the sound and finished his wine. Dregmir was steeped in more myth and history than he'd realized, overshadowed perhaps by the nightmarish fables originating from Romania, but remarkable nonetheless. And who are those men in the picture? The three atop the hill? 
Their faces flashed before him, their wicked smiles. The steward shifted uncomfortably in his chair. Those are the observers, the men who knew Ophelia to be innocent of the crimes she was accused of, and yet did nothing. They placed their own interests above that of her life. They whispered ill-favored words in Pavo's ear, made him believe his own love was cursed. He sat by and watched as the villagers executed his Ophelia. And what became of them? How does the story end? Once Pavel realized the truth, his vengeance was swift. He hunted down those who had conspired against his wife and put them to the sword. The observers fled north and became a part of another legend you may be familiar with, that of Vladimir III. The Impaler. The very same. Simon smiled at this and saw that the steward was smiling too. How very poetic, he said, removing his glasses and placing them on the table before him. A fitting end to a sad story. The steward laughed and shook his head. That is not the end. No? No. The steward rubbed his hands together and rested his elbows on the table. There was a light in his eyes when he spoke. Pavel made a deal, you see. A deal with the djinn, Belioth. In exchange for the souls of his betrayers, Belioth would allow him to meet with Ophelia. For a single night, once every year, the two lovers could be with each other. One soul for one night. A happy ending after all. Simon wiped out a stain on the lens of his glasses, before returning them to the crook of his nose. For some, the steward agreed, but not for those souls Pavel traded to be with Ophelia. Yes, aside from that, Simon stifled a laugh and pushed back his feet, before rising from the table. I think I'll head off to see Ophelia. The thought rose unbidden, and Simon felt a moment of unease. He frowned, shaking the notion from his head. Thank you for your time. Simon hurried past the first floor, ignoring the urge he felt to stand before the painting, to stare at it until dawn's breaking. Simon awoke to a thump. He patted at his bedside table until yellow light poured out from a small lamp, illuminating the room. He lay on his back, waiting for his eyes to adjust. There it was again a soft tapping coming from the stairway outside his room. He was looking at the mechanical clock on his wall when the tapping rang out again. It sounded like someone was coming up the stairs. Tap, tap, tap. Joseph. He dragged himself out from beneath his blankets and pulled open the door, fully expecting to see his friend coming up the stairs. Instead, there was nothing. The wall light shone faintly from the converted sconces beside the stairway, but the way itself was empty. Tap. 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 Simon frowned as he heard the sound again. It was coming from the level below, he realized. The broken halogen bulb, and the thought of the steward trying to replace it forced Simon out of his room, despite the mild sense of trepidation that had begun to wrangle its way into his psyche. He walked hesitantly down the stairs, his bare feet cushioned by the thick carpet beneath him. The tapping grew louder as he approached the floor, and he felt unease settle upon him. What if the steward had taken a fall? The man looked strong, in a wiry sort of way, but he was old. Simon took a deep breath and moved swiftly down the last few steps. He'd do what he could. The first floor was empty, and there was no sign of the steward or Joseph. Indeed, there was nothing to indicate the sound had come from here at all. Simon paused at the bottom of the steps and peered down the corridor. The light flickered for a moment, before returning to a soft, steady glow, and Simon realized the tapping had come to a stop. He sighed to himself in relief as the tension began to dissipate. Truth be told, he wasn't sure what he'd have done if he'd found the steward prone on the floor in this place. In a foreign country, miles away from emergency services, he was about to turn around and head back to his room when a nagging sensation tugged at him. Just one last look, he thought, turning to the painting. Saint Ophelia stared back at him, her hands open in a gesture of peace. The sad smile on her face made Simon feel a momentary pang of loss. Strange to feel that way about someone you've never met, that had quite possibly never existed. He lifted a hand to the painting to run a finger over the canvas. It was smooth beneath his touch, which surprised him. The paint looked thick and blotchy in places, but it was quite even. He furrowed his brow when he noticed something he hadn't spotted before. Almost hidden behind the crowd of angry villagers, a little man sat behind an easel of his own. A portrait of the artist, thought Simon as he stared at the figure. There was something eerily familiar about him, 
about the grey tufts of hair and bright staring eyes, the dirt that covered his fingers. Not dirt. Paint. Tap, tap, tap. Fascinating, said Joseph. And he just disappeared without a word? He was gone when I came to offer his morning coffee. Must have been an emergency. The steward shrugged. He still owes me for two nights' stay. Joseph dug a hand into his pockets and retrieved a thick leather wallet. I'll cover it. He can pay me back next time I see him. He pulled out a wad of notes and began counting. And how much for that painting beside my room? Thank you, sir, but it's not for sale. You sure I can't tempt you? The steward smiled and shook his head. It's a particular favorite of two of my regulars. They'd never forgive me. Joseph raised a brow and stared around the lobby. You've got regulars in a place like this? No offense. They only visit once a year, but they've been coming for a very long time. My oldest customers, you might say. In fact, I believe they will be visiting tonight. Great, said Joseph, unimpressed. He placed a twenty on the counter and looked up at the steward. This will cover it? Oh, yes, sir. That's quite enough. Good, said Joseph, already turning to the staircase. He felt an odd desire to have another look at that painting. <laughs>